exhausted. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I've always wanted to come to a Creative Time Summit. I've been looking forward to it for so many years, but I'm always so busy working on all of these other projects and I never get around to it. And this year, NATO called me and I thought, I have to, I have to be there. I have to be there for my, for my friends. So thank you for inviting me. We are in a, a conundrum. I find us in a sort of an extraordinary, uh, almost surreal space in time. And uh, of course, thinking a great deal about the turmoil and the despair that um, highlights and underscores the, uh, the depths of this moment, uh, this disruption, these shifts in paradigms and ideas, and people, needs and wants. I ask myself about this question, I probe myself about these, 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 these words like what is democracy and what is freedom and what is art and what is love and what is grace? These qualities, conditions, concepts, conceits, emotions. You know, usually we don't know exactly what it is. We always say we'll, we'll know it when we see it. For the last uh, year, I've been really coming to terms with this idea about grace, what it is. And when I look out to this audience and I look out to uh, the people that I care so much about, the thing that keeps coming back to my mind, the thing that keeps, uh, that, that, that I feel so strongly about is that, that even within all of your despair, and even within all of the ways in which you have been humiliated and attacked and made to feel ashamed of who you are, what you want, what you desire, even within all of that, you still offer up your humanity to the person who was blaming you for that thing. You still give it. You still give charity, you still give compassion, you still give humanity to the person. Even in the midst of the storm, you maintain the core of yourself, the core of your meaning, the core of your, your humanity, the core of your values. You are not shaken. When I look at the young women that have started Black Lives Matter, I see their extraordinary grace. Mr. Frank talked a bit about, about Obama, about the Clintons. I agree a lot with what he has to say. I think I've come to really understand in a very deep way that no man, no woman really encapsulates and runs an administration. That it is moved by very, very deep and powerful forces and that a president is simply a figurehead no matter who he is who she is. They represent, and they cannot always represent their own politics. They represent other forces that are at work, try as they might to resist them. And so I think that we've, again, um, find ourselves, and Obama has found himself in an extraordinary circumstance and condition. Carpetbaggers taking the state, draining the coffers, running off and leaving it to him. Day by day, the country was slowly, persistently changing. Traditions were dying and forces were colliding, demographics shifting. The evidence along with the anger was everywhere, so bitter you could almost taste it. Tongues were wagging, fingers were pointing here, there, and everywhere, blaming you, blaming me, blaming them, blaming us. And tripped up by forces beyond their control, White men were disaffected and disenfranchised. Black men were disaffected and dying. But both a part of the working class. In the eyes of the state were devoid of power. And yet blinded by rage and race and historical circumstance, each continued to blame the other. The thing that I love about about being uh, an artist and being aware of other artists is that other artists teach me 
indeed, what I'm doing. And so for the last year, I worked on a piece, and then I realized, actually, that I was really working on uh, a piece uh, that was essentially Antigone. This piece is a performance piece, I imagine. And uh, I'm referring to this work because I think that a lot of what has happened over the last year really underscores uh, and brings us back to this great, great, great story. Rightly or wrongly, challenging his brother and the laws of the state that refused to recognize his right, rightly or wrongly, Polynices, the brother of Antigone, is killed in his struggle for power. Rightly or wrongly, it is deemed by Creon, the ruler of the land, that Polynices, who has broken the law, should not be buried, but his body must lie in the open, exposed, so that nature will take its course. Against Creon's order and responding to what she considers not the laws of man, but the laws, the higher laws of God, the higher laws of justice. Antigone decides that she's going to bury her brother regardless, defying these laws. And that this ancient story of Antigone reaches across the expanse of time, this vast expanse of time, and yet and still has meaning for our lives is very important and I think underscores the importance of the arts to function over the course of centuries. Antigone, of course, was sent to her doom. She was sent to her um, burial chamber alive so that she could understand the depth of death and its despair horrible to be buried alive, an amazing story. Because she decided that she needed to bury her brother and it occurred to me that I simply wanted to uh, bury my brothers. I wanna live. And so I thought that a part of the, the resistance that we're feeling in our country is that there is a great portion of the population who refuses to believe that these men, rightly or wrongly, who have been killed by the police, rightly or wrongly, have a right to a proper burial. I believe that they do, and I ask all of you for the permission to understand the just need and the right for these men to be understood, rightly or wrongly, in their crime, right? To be buried properly, whether their offense, again, was rightly or wrongly presented. Let's start our video. How do you measure a life? How do you measure a life in this mystery of all mysteries, in the Alpha and in the Omega, on a day coming in a world without end? How do you measure a life? Imagine that you are taking a, a stroll. You're kicking it with your wife, your partner, your kid, your friends. And a police car speeds by. It's red lights, strobing, flashing. And just imagine that for some reason it comes and stops. It stops right in front of you for no apparent reason and for reasons unknown. Imagine that the police, for reasons unknown, ask you for your ID. You comply, and when you reach into your jacket pocket, the nervous officer imagines that perhaps you're reaching for a gun. And before you know it, a shot is fired. You feel it traveling through your body for no apparent reason, for no apparent reason. Imagine that you're out for a stroll, kicking it with your friends as young people are apt to do on a phone, passing the time, and a neighborhood vigilante approaches you, asking you why 
you're in the neighborhood, questioning your very presence, and a struggle, of course, ensues, and before you know it, a shot is fired, and a child is killed. My daughter called me recently, just the other day, because uh, she knew of a young man who had also just been killed. And then several days later, she called me again to tell me that somebody else had just been killed. Imagine that your child is always uh, in a constant state of fear. Imagine that. Imagine what that must feel like for you to watch your child in those circumstances. Imagine that your child is dying in your very arms. It's one of the things that the Greeks often asked us to do, that violence was very rarely displayed on stage. They asked you to imagine, to put yourself in the space of, in the place of, in order to understand something that might be real about, about who we are and how we came to be. Uh, but this whole idea about, about imagining and, uh, and then finally thinking about, um, of course, Michael Brown's parents or Eric Garner's parents and family and wife and imagining the, the grief of his mother and the suffering of his father and, of course, the need for revenge on the part of his sisters. If I again think back on Antigone, Antigone tells the people that the bright lights of history are now shining down on them, on her, on them and us together. And exposed now all things are knowable. The age of innocence has passed and we are actually responsible for our own futures. The people that have died over the last years it's been sort of extraordinary that all of this happened under the, uh, under the, uh, the Obama administration, isn't it? You know, that all of this tyranny would happen while he is in office, that all of these young black men would die in this way is, uh, is an extraordinary thing. People were 25 and 22, 31, 36, 12, 43, 37, a father, an uncle, a brother. She was 34, he was 27, she was 35, he was 18, he was 12, a cousin, a husband, she was 24, a wife, a mother, a sister, an aunt. I'm going to commemorate just a few people. I wanted to commemorate all of the fallen and all of those who have had the ability to endure. Commemorating every black man who lives to see age 21. Commemorating Trevon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner. Commemorating Tamara Rice, Freddie Gray, and Sandra Bland. Commemorating Christian uh, uh, Taylor, Samuel Du Bois, and Walter Scott. Thank you. Commemorating um, uh, Tony Robinson, Philip White, and Jamel Reed. Commemorating Tanisha Anderson and John Crawford, Dante Parker. Commemorating Damon Howard, Thomas Allen, Ezra Ford. Commemorating Jerry Levette, Lavelle Hall, Bobby Gross. Commemorating Brandon Glenn, Frank Shepard, Walter Chapman. Commemorating David Felix. Commemorating Spencer McCain. Commemorating Darius Stewart. Commemorating Laquan McDonald. Commemorating Alton Sterling. Philandro Castile. Commemorating the Emmanuel Nine. 
for all of their generosity, inviting someone into their space that would take their lives, I commemorate them. And I ask you to commemorate them along with me, to give them proper burial, to recognize their need and their want of a proper recognition of the lives that they have given up without fear of retribution and without, uh, without shame. And if someone asks to you who uh, committed this audacious act, this crime of standing up for her brother, you can point to me and you can say, she did. He was 22, she was 31, he was 36. He was trying to she get out 28. his ID and his wallet out his um, pocket and the officer just shot him in his arm. We're waiting for a back. I will, sir, no worries, I will. He just shot his arm off. I told him not to reach for it, I told him to get his hand off. He had, you told him to get his ID, sir, and his driver's license. Oh my God, please don't tell me he's dead. Please don't tell me my boyfriend just went like that. Keep your hands where they are. Yes, I will, sir. I'll keep my hands where they are. Please don't tell me this, Lord. Please, Jesus, don't tell me that he's gone. Please don't tell me that he's gone. Please, officer, don't tell me that you just did this to him. He was 29. I think that no matter what the circumstances are now under the conditions that we face, that one way or another, we have to give it up. We have to participate in this process. Democracy in one way or another is evolving. We know that it is not where it needs to be. Um, and so um, we have to vote. And so I've put together a piece that I'd like uh, to share with you on the the need, uh, the need to vote. more afraid of a ballot than a bullet. No, no, our work's not done. But if we are going to advance the cause of justice and equality and prosperity and freedom, then we also have to acknowledge that even if we eliminated every restriction on voting, we would still have one of the lowest voting rates among free peoples. That's not good. That is on us. And I, I am reminded of all those folks who had to count bubbles in a bar of soap, beaten trying to register voters in Mississippi, risked everything so that they could pull that lever. So, if I hear anybody saying their vote does not matter, then it doesn't matter who we elect. Read up on your history. It matters. We've got to get people to vote. In fact, if you want to give Michelle and me a good send-off, and that was a beautiful video, but don't just watch us walk off into the sunset now. Get people registered to vote. If you care about our legacy, realize everything we stand for is at stake. All the progress we've made is at stake in this election. My name may not be on the ballot, but our progress is on the ballot. Tolerance is on the ballot. Democracy is on the ballot. Justice is on the ballot. Good schools are on the ballot. Ending 
committing mass incarceration. That's on the ballot right now. And there is one candidate who will advance those, those things. And there is another candidate whose defining principle, the central theme of his candidacy, is opposition to all that we've done. There's no such thing as a vote that doesn't matter. It all matters. And after we have achieved historic turnout in 2008 and 2012, especially in the African-American community, I will consider it a personal insult, an insult to my legacy, if this community lets down its guard and fails to activate itself in this election. You want to give me a good send-off? Go vote! And I'm going to be working as hard as I can these next seven weeks to make sure folks do. Hope is on the ballot, and fear is on the ballot, too. Hope is on the ballot, and fear is on the ballot, too. Wow, that was powerful. So, Somebody must be paying y'all. Yeah. That. that was that was wonderful, very powerful stuff. So I've never met you before, but when I went years ago, I lived in Barack Obama's neighborhood in Chicago, and he was my state senator. And um, I mean, everyone knew about. Well, we're not going to talk about the Chicago police, but. Here's the thing, so that's the neighborhood of Hyde Park. These days it's a very you know, desirable place to live in because the Secret Service patrols it. You know. But at the western edge of Hyde Park uh, is a great big armory. And that armory was built in the 1880s or 90s with the you know, thinking that when, when the class war comes, and they would talk about that in those days, that the poor people who live over by the stockyards are coming this way. And I wonder, I wonder if that's, if that's, are we headed, I mean, look at, look at this, look at how our society is coming apart. And that Black Lives Matter is one of the few, like, things that I'm really hopeful about, and I'm really, you know, this is, this is a sign of life. This is a, this is a great thing. But is it, are we going to get better, or are we going to get worse? Come what, come on. Come on. Don't what do you think? Something like that. What? <laughs> you want me to ask you something hard? <laughs> yeah, I can ask you about the, what, but you have to, you have to say, what do you think? That's not even a real question. He's just like, he's just like bullshit. As smart as this man is, I know he has like a better fucking question for me than that. Right? Well, what would I but, ask but, you? But, like, what you, what you, you know, think of the Clintons you know or something? No, 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 of course not. You know, it's, it's very interesting because I just finished also um, a piece on surveillance. Which was really great. It, you know, it took me like, you know, like, you know, a, a year to sort of do, sort of slowly, slowly thinking about it. And then in, in thinking about surveillance and thinking about like, you know, because this is the 50th anniversary for many, many things. It's the 50th anniversary on the March on Selma. It's the 50th anniversary of the, you know, formation of the Black Panther Party. You know, it's like all this stuff, right? So your 50th anniversary too? It's his 50th anniversary. Yeah. You know? And, and, um, and of course, looking at all of this stuff, around the Panther Party. I'm in a show around the Panther Party that just opened last week at Oakland, California. And as you know, the Panther Party was of course formed um, uh, as a result of, of police um, brutality uh, and they were formed to serve that community, right? I mean, that was the reason, really, that they came into, into, into existence, right, it's to figure out, you know, like a way of protecting its community and to figure out how to feed children. And to figure out how to feed children. And this is very interesting because the thing that I think is so very important about them as a lesson was that e even, even as they were destroyed, even as they were destroyed, 
is that they were very proactive, that they were always there patrolling their streets, right? You know, that, that you have to begin to set up very, very specific kinds of strategies for moving, for moving ahead. And what are the strategies for moving ahead? What are, what are the strategies for organizing? Right? So you pull together sort of this sort of amazing conference like this, right? And there are many people that are talking about, you know, some of us have humor, some of us have seriousness, some of us are simply dark, some of us are in despair, some of us have strategy, some of us have organization, some of us are thinking about, you know, sort of social systems and how we think forwardly about, uh, about uh, social systems, right? Um, uh, we're thinking about what is really a left, right? It's certainly not the Democratic Party. That's bullshit, right? I mean, you know, it's, I mean, right. it's not that. You know that, right? I so I mean, so it's, yeah. I mean, you know, Moving so it's here a to very Washington. interesting really, thing. Really anyway, so this is really great. Thank you all so much for inviting me, and uh, we'll see you at cocktail. <laughs>